Hi, I'm Paul Steele from CodeShare.co.uk. Welcome to episode 16 in this series where I'll show you how to build a website with Umbraco V8. In this series, we're going to cover a few different things. One of them is fixing a, something that was left over from the last episode, which was the URL on the view all posts. And I'm also going to show you about the benefit of using the article service and combining that with using caching. And then we'll also have a look at putting the dictionary values in so we can use dictionary values in Umbraco uh, for things that is text on the template that's not necessarily text in the content item. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll have a look at doing lazy images and image cropping. So it's a collection of a lot of things. So because there's a lot to get through, um, let's get started straight away then. So the first thing that I mentioned, when we last worked on this, and we implemented the article service, and we got it to render out the um, these latest articles. And depending on whether you're on the home page or the blog page, um, it would render them out with the 10 or the 3. Um, now, it worked fine on the blog page with the view all posts, but when we did it for on the home page, it just used the URL of whatever content item you're on. So view all doesn't work anymore. So we'll put that in the comments as well. So thanks for raising that. I did spot that as well. And I was always going to fix it on this next one. So let me explain why it's an issue and what we need to fix. So we are using our custom view page, which when you don't pass a model in, it just uses the our published content item as the model. And here we're doing model.url in the URL for the links. And so model.url, when you're using this on the home page, will be the home page's URL. So the way to fix this um, is to, when we create our article results set, we want to add in a property on the article results set of the URL of the article list page. So we can do a public string URL. So this is on article results set, which is in clean blog core models. And we're going to clean blog core view models, article results set. This is the file that I'm editing. And then if we just do make this a property that we can edit. And then in our article service, where we get this uh, latest articles, when we Pass it. When we create the object, we just need to, at the end of here, we just need to get article list.url. And I'll just show you this up here. So I put a comma on the end there and I just did URL equals article list URL. So here we get the article list page. So we already have that. So we can pass that URL in. So now our article result set has got a URL property that we can use. So in this latest articles partial, instead of using model.url, we can use result set.url. And then do a build. So we'll rebuild the solution so that the um, models um, get put into that. So after the rebuild, we'll give it a, a refresh and we should see that we've fixed this first issue. Go to the page. So if we hover over that in the corner, we can see it's just going to the home pages URL. Well, actually, we want it to go to the blog URL. And instead of hard coding in blog, that would be rubbish. And um, we'll do it this way. So we'll refresh the page. Just wait for this to update any minute now. Any minute now, come on, right, it's done. Hover over that and it's going to slash blog. And then on the next buttons, they are blog and blog. So that's all worked. So that's the first thing ticked off the list. What's next? Next thing is I was talking about caching. So one of the benefits of doing this, um, using this article service and calling it from the template of say home and where we call latest articles and then using the custom view page for us to be able to have access to the article service on the custom view page so if we go to this clean blog view page here and then this has got access a property called article service so one of those benefits is 
that we can cache this partial so it doesn't have to call this all the time. So if we go into the home and we do cached partial, actually first, before we cache it, let's just see that it's not being cached first of all. So in here, where we've got our post preview, in the in the title, I'm just going to do at date time, this dot now. This is how I always like to test the caching, whether caching is on or not. If I've, I'll save that and then I'll refresh and what we'll see is the date and time will come into here and you'll see seconds on it. So we can just keep refreshing and see that that's updating. So there's definitely no caching going on with this partial at the moment. So then the next thing to do would be to leave that on, go to the home page and call cached partial. And then in, in here, it, it's got some um, things that you need to pass in. So the first thing you need to pass in is the current model. And then the next thing you need to do is tell it how many seconds do you want it to cache for? And I always do 3,600. I think I think that's a whole day. Uh, I can't remember, 60 times 60. Oh, is that an hour? I don't know. 60 times 60, it sounds good. Yeah, maybe an hour, um, whatever, however many seconds you want to do, I always tend to do that. So now we'll refresh and we'll we'll go back and refresh and we'll see that it won't, it will still be not cached. And I'll explain why. And this would have been in the last video had it have worked first time, but look, it's not cached. So we're, we're left wondering why is it not cached? We just said use a cached partial. And the other thing you need to do is be aware that you're working in debug mode. When you're working in debug mode, it doesn't cache. So if we set debug mode to false, so that is in the web config file, in the compilation um, attribute, in the compilation um, item, we go to debug and we set that to be false and save and then refresh. So because we've edited the config file, it will be a bit slower in loading the page because um, it will almost restart the site. So let that update. Now we've got 12.51 and 46 seconds. Let's refresh again. And 53 and 54 and 55. Right, what's going on? Help. Do we need to do a rebuild? So what page am I on? Oh, I'm on the blog page. So there's me panicking that I've done something wrong. I've not actually called it to be cached on the blog page. I should be on the home page calling it to be cached. So don't get caught out like I nearly did then. Yep, so we'll wait for the home page to load again because I've just done another rebuild. Sorry about this. It's taken a while. Right, so 12.52 and 34 seconds. Let's refresh. 12.52 and 34 seconds and again. Yeah, so it, it's not even, um, so it just remembers what the output was for that partial and it just returns that. So it doesn't have to call the article service every time. So you'll see that that will actually benefit you. And what you want to do as well is on this call, because we're using this partial in, in two different places, we just want to do comma true. And the true part is for the cache by page. So we do want to cache it by page because we're going to use it on two different pages. We've got it on the, the um, we've got it on the blog, and we also have it over there. So what we can do here, we can copy this, and then we can go to the article list page, and then we can paste that in there and save. So we'll replace the call, which was just to HTML partial latest articles and we'll replace it with this one which is cached now i'm just wondering if it'll work because the only difference on the blog one is it's got a paging query string so 12.53.44 we'll refresh that and that will stay at that time that's good testing the models builder right now if we go to the next page i'm just wondering if the query string will make it think it's the next page or not no it hasn't so there's an issue here with the query string and I wonder if there is a um, cash by member. Right. So we might not want to do caching on this. I'm not sure on how to do it. I'd have to look into it. If you look into it 
and you find out how to get it to work with look, paying attention to the query string, then please comment on the video. Um, I'm not going to look into it at the moment, but I can just show you that we don't have to cache on this on this one. And so therefore we can um, take the caching off and we can still use that same partial, but it's not cached and it will the paging will work again. Page two of two. Page one of two, yeah. So that's back to working again. But if, yeah, if you do look into it, please comment and let me know on there. So that was the caching part of it. Um, what else did I say at the beginning? It, it was the dictionary values. So we've got set certain places around the site which is hard coded in, and we want to fix those. So let's have a look at the templates then. We'll just we'll just have a look to see. So starting from the home page. Is there any text? There's the view all text here. So we could put that into a dictionary item. Now, I think when we did the footer, I told you about the dictionary because we did footer copyright name. So we can do uh, another dictionary item. So we're going to translation. If you can't see the translation menu, you need to go into your user uh, or groups. So you can allow it per group. So let's just say um, administrators, and then you can add the section and you can choose the section that they can have like that. So translation, uh, my administrators group has got access to translation. Then you want to refresh and then you will have access to it. So in dictionary create, and then we'll just say um, blog and then view dot view all. And we'll create this dictionary item and we want to say view all and save that. Now this isn't a big site. Sometimes you might want to create translation dictionary items under you know, underneath one. So you might want one for blog and then under that you'd have blog.view all and blah, blah, blah. But because I don't think there are many within this site, we won't need to do that. So how do we use this? Well, what we do is we, on the article list here, where we had view all hard-coded, we just do at umbraco dot get dictionary value, and then we paste in that key, which was blog dot view all. And we'll look at it from the context of the blog page, because we've not cached on the blog page now, we've cached on the home page. The other thing about validating the cache I have needed to tell you. Oh no, that won't work. So what I need to do, yeah, you know, I'll explain this. So to invalidate the cache, you do a save and publish. So any of these save and publish item will invalidate the cache. So where we had that time, 1255.27 on the homepage, latest articles, if we refresh now, it will go to 1257.48, and that will basically be the last time that that was saved and published. So you could think, oh, maybe um, one thing you could do is you could have a partial maybe in your footer that is just for you, like last save and publish time or, I don't know, last load time, and then that will just show date time now. And then if that's not updated for a while, it means that it's cached. And then when it gets saved and published again, that will get changed. Anyway, that's something you could work to your advantage if you set a really long caching time or something like that. So um, this text is coming through here. Let's just have a quick play so we can test this. So if we change this to be some rubbish, Go to save, load it on the home page. It will stay as view all because we've added caching. If I go to the home page and I save and publish, and then I refresh, that's changed. So again, that shows the power of the caching. Change that back to view all. Save content. Uh, save and publish. Refresh. There we go. And so that is one dictionary item down. So let's have a look to see if there's any more hard coded things in here about. I'll just open these. So there might be something on the search page. Um, so I don't think about's got anything hard coded in. 
the test article hasn't. So we've got next and previous, so we can do that. Um, so we can do translation. We can create another one, blog.next. We'll just say next, save. And then while we're here, we'll just create the previous one as well. Blog.prev and do prev like so. And we will just go into the Visual Studio and we'll add that in. So um, this is on here. So what we can do is we can copy this bit where we where we got the dictionary value for view all. Paste it over next and we'll just change view all to be next. Same again for prev. Change that to be prev. Save that, and then if we go to the blog page, we should find that the previous and next items still work. And they've still got text in them, and next and previous. And you can change that just to see if it's actually updating. So let's just change prev to Asda. Next. There we go. So that's how we're doing that. So if you had different languages uh, in your site, say if we added French as well, and you change the culture of your site to be French, then you can have your translations in here. So if you have multiple languages on your site, it would just appear in, under here. So you'd have your different translations for this dictionary item. But you don't have to use it if you've got multiple languages. You can use it in this case where you've got things that are hard-coded into the templates that you want to take out of being hard-coded and actually um, be still managed within Umbraco to a certain degree. All right, so is that saved? That's all saved. Um, so we'll look on the other templates. So about, blog, blog, search. So maybe we want to... Instead of this being hard coded and this being hard coded, we could put those into dictionary items as well. So search dot placeholder. And then we could say search for something. And then the other one was just search button. Search dot button text. So on the search page, find that. Here we are. So instead of search for something, we can do, uh, we can paste in our get dictionary value. We can change it to be the correct key. Now it might be easier just to copy and paste it from this name here. So you don't accidentally type it in wrong. So that's one and then We've got the search text there. Button text. And then we can go back to the search page and refresh that and just see that that's still working OK. Yeah. Oh, no. Search button text hasn't worked. So did I do something wrong? Oh, I didn't update it. So search. So you can see that that's updated there. So that's how we can manage that as well. Are there any other pages that we are using? Maybe contact. On the contact form, we probably have got some hard-coded values on there. Um, even on the search, we might say your search for, yes, and then returned on all these results. So this one's a little bit trickier because you've got some HTML in it. But we can we can do this. So this one is quite a good one, actually. So let's just copy the contents of this. And we'll put it into a new dictionary value. So this is a bit more of a complicated one, but we'll do it search uh, dot results text. 
do create and then let's just see what this is so first thing we're going to use some um placeholders basically so i'll do zero oh. so i'm going to put gator brackets in there so parentheses so i'm going to put that one for the first one this one for the next one one and then actually what was that result count so that's still the same oh yeah I'll just continue and then this is whether or not to use the plural <laughs> bit of overkill but hey ho so now um, this is a bit of HTML with some placeholder things as well so but we can use some code to transform that and inject those values into there so if we go back into here and we can just do a couple of returns so what we can do is we can do at html dot raw and then we can do string dot format and then we can do umbraco dot get dictionary value and we can ask it for search results text then we're going to format it so we want to rep so where we've got those placeholders in here we're going to replace some of the things so we need to replace the first one was going to be search query that was a zero one then the next one was going to be a result count and then the final one was going to be this one here we'll do a comma like that now it might say that we don't need the brackets on that one so I can take off the outer brackets and I've left HTML raw because we do have some strong tags in there so let's just see how that works so that's the whole thing HTML raw string dot format get dictionary value search results text we're passing in the three variables search query result count and then whether or not to pass in the s012 that should be saved and then we'll just go on to this search page again and we'll see if it actually works it might not work we might have broken it but it was worth a shot so we'll do about hey your search for about returned one result so it did work and maybe the no this um, Braco. <laughs> uh, what was the most popular name? Uh, different. Okay. Your search for different returned 15 and um, results. So that's working. So that was the uh, dictionaries. And then we can just quickly have a look to see if we need to finish it off on any others. So we've got name, email, message, etc. So we could do it for those as well. Let's go to the contact template and have a look. And if there are any that I've missed, you've got the idea. You can um, continue it from here. Just because I've not done it, you don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to wait around for me to finish it all. So with name, we can do at umbraco.getDictionaryValue contact dot name label actually those placeholder ones oh it doesn't matter yeah I'm going to take off name uh, label I'm just going to have it as name and then what I can do here in placeholder and then name I can just do this and then plus the string of dots I've just gone off the screen so that way eh, will that work don't need the at hopefully that will work so we'll get the dictionary value and it'll add the three dots at the end so we'll do one for name one for email 
and one for message. Well, it doesn't like the one for message. What have I done wrong? Let me just copy that again. Message. So we need to go into the dictionary part and just add these ones. So create contact dot name. Contact dot email. Did I specify a value on the name one? Yep. And then do contact dot message. What are we doing for time? Oh, that's okay. Yep, name, email, and message. So now um, we've done that. We, we can just check that they are being used on the front end and see if there's any errors. Seem to be working for the placeholder text and the label, uh, that email address. Where did the email address come from? Oh, yeah, we didn't do the one for that. So... We just need to replace it in here. So we've used all of those and then we have a send button. So we may as well put that in as well. Send. Let's uh, refresh this. Oh, we don't have contact.send, so we'll just create that before it complains. It might already complain by the time we do it. There we go. You must enter a valid email address. Yeah. So the validation messages, um, they that's a bit more complicated, but you can get it to work with the .NET side to pull through the values from the dictionary. But again, I'm not going to go through that on this one. Um, then, so the other thing was image cropper. So we've got some images that we're using on our site, one for the page header, and we are getting a crop URL, very specific number here. But instead of calling the numbers and doing it that way, we could um, do it like this. So if we go into uh, settings and then we go to data types and image cropper, then we can create an alias. So we'll do page header. And the values that we want is 1903 for the width and the height to be 532. And we'll add that. And then we can do um, all the other ones as well. So let's just have a look where we have images. So we've got the page header. Is that it? I think these ones aren't really using a crop. They're just within the post. Oh, we might. Yeah, because we don't actually use them. Very simple on this side. That's probably why I didn't do it. But anyway, we can still have a look. And what I'll do... I'll remove that actually. We'll do page header um, dot large. We'll do that nineteen oh three by five three two. Add and then we'll do page header dot tiny and we'll do one hundred and ninety by fifty three. Because I'm going to show you next the lazy loading. Now, um, let's use this page header at large. So this is the full size one. So instead of get crop URL, we're going to do page header dot large. 
save that and then go to the home page and hope that it still works nope it broke so let's see oh because we've defined a crop and we haven't gone into the image to save it that's why it's caused this error so we can go into this and we'll do save now you see this this is image cropper so if we reload the page again and we choose where we want this dot to appear uh, this dot to be the focus you can see these get updated here so we'll make sure that the cat is definitely on show save that and then we want to and if you want to you can make it different per crop like you could bring that up there and you can zoom in and things that crop because i'm not bothered about that i just leave it as that so now we have an image crop and we go back to the front end we refresh it will have saved that crop size for us so that's good um so that's how you use the image cropper so you can add all these different crop settings so we have our page header large and page header tiny now the reason why i was saying about the tiny is because we're going to use some lazy loading so we've got this um, lazy sizes and lazy sizes is this library that i found when looking at trying to improve the performance of my site CodeShare. And this is what GitHub, not GitHub, uh, Google recommends on um, on the instructions to, you know, when you do an audit, a lighthouse audit, Google recommends that you follow a tutorial which implements this. And I've got it on CodeShare. So are you using lazy sizes, min.js and ls unveil hooks? lazy sizes min.js i'm using this one and let me just verify that that is the one yep 5.2 that's the one that i'm using on code share so we can go into here we can add our yeah we can we can go into here we can add that script so in here i'm going to add a new script new javascript file call it lazy sizes dot min dot js and i'm going to paste in the contents of that that i copied so that's the first file and then the second file was called uh, ls unveil hooks min.js we'll google that again by the same person um, a farkas so if we go to there and we can copy this and again this is version 5.2 and then we'll go into our project we'll do add JavaScript file, lazy, um, what was this one called? <laughs> LS unveil hooks. LS unveil hooks dot min dot JS. Is it dot? Is it LS dot? It is. So I just need to make sure I rename that correctly ls dot unveil hooks and then paste that in there and save so now that we have those two files we can reference them in our master template which is here and we're using um, the same as what i'm doing on code share so we can do that we're using client dependency so html dot require js and then we're going to say that it's in the scripts folder and the first one is called lazy sizes dot min dot js and we're going to use an attribute of new and then 
async equals uh, equals async. So it just loads this after it doesn't hold the page up. It will just load this asynchronously. And I'll just copy and paste that, and I'll just change the name of this one to be ls.unveilhooks.min.js. And I'm just going to make sure that that is the same name as what I saved, ls.unveilhooks.min.js. So that's going to load in those two files for us. Now, the beauty of these files is that it will very easily it will let us use lazy loading. Um, so lazy loading, let me just show you on code share. If we have a look, watch the images. When I go to the blog section, if it might not happen, it is happening too fast. But let's go to like one of the last pages and see the images go from blurry to non blurry. So I, I first render them with a small image. So that's the first thing we can do here is you know how we had the page header. And we set the source of that page header image to be the page header dot large. We can just to test this out. It's going to look like this page header dot tiny because I made it a tenth of the size. So if we go back to the home page and refresh, what we should find is that we've got a blurry image. So a very small image that the page will load with. And then what we'll do is we'll replace that very small image with the the full size image that we want to use so that is page header dot tiny you could make that even smaller but that's using a lot less space when the page first loads and then it'll be replaced in with the original now you don't have to put in one to start with you can just have it so there's no image there and then it will just load in the full image so if we just call just make a copy of, of this variable and just call it small small image url like this and then we can just copy this line here so that is going to be tiny i can't spell can't spell small so that's going to be tiny and then we'll we'll make the normal one be large right and so where i'm going with this is we just put even it even works on background images so it works on foreground images and background images so with this one we can do data dash bg equals and then we just give it the uh, image url and then where we are here we're going to give it the small image url So really, I think we probably should do the same as what we've got here. We've got this check to see that it's not too small. So we'll do the same. So in the data BG, just paste that in and just replace that with image URL. So in data BG is going to be the full size image URL. So that's what it was in the style block. Um, so we'll take off the style bit here because all we're doing is we're just telling it if the image URL isn't null or white space, then in this attribute, put the image URL. Otherwise, don't render the attribute. That's basically what it's going to do. And then in the style tag, we're saying you can start off by loading in the small image if it's available. So let's try this out and watch the page and we should see that it loads in. Uh, actually, we might need to turn debugging back on because we've changed the client dependency. Yeah, let's put this back on to true. And so it renders out each script tag individually and it doesn't cache it as well. So we should hopefully see that this late, um, header image will go from blurry and then it will pop into the, the full size sharp image. Didn't work, baby. No. Right. So I'm going to find out what the issue is. So the first thing I'm going to check is the console. 
do a refresh of the page. And have a look at the console. So there was no console errors. So that's the first thing we needed to see. Next, we need to see, does the script get loaded in? So where we render out all the JavaScript, is it rendering out unveil hooks? So unveil hooks is there. LS unveil hooks and the other one. And that's a sync. Then the lazy sizers. So they're both getting rendered on. So it's not that that's the issue. So what's next? How can we debug this next? Let's go into the page header. Let's check the time. All right, page header, tiny and large. So we've got image URL is getting set to the large version. Small image URL is getting set to that. Let's just check that they're both being set. Do we have, oh, now the one thing that I didn't add was the class called lazy load. So on this here, we also need to add another class to it called lazy load. And that's how it identifies which ones to go through and do the lazy loading. So we should see that if we refresh this now, it should work because it's got the lazy load ca uh, class on it. And there you go, it's worked. So we refresh that. You can see if I refresh without caching. Yeah. So it's working. It snaps into place. And if we inspect it, you'll see that class gets changed to be lazy loaded. If we go in here, that lazy load class gets changed to be lazy loaded. So that's good. Um, other things you can do with this is you can render different images for different sizes. So if we just do lazy, if we just Google lazy sizes, and then go back up to the repo, it's got on the README, it's got all of the instructions about it. So um, you can do it. There's the data source, so that'll be for the image tag. So instead of source, you have a data source. So you're doing the source attribute, you do your small version of the image. And then in the um, data source attribute, you do the full size image. Make sure you give it a class of lazy load, and then that's how it will work. Um, but you can do it for responsive images as well. So you could have a picture tag. Has it got an example of a picture tag? So if you've got a picture tag with a source set, and sorry, with the different images at the different sizes, it can do it like that. Or with this um, image source sets as well, you can do it. So with the data source set, and then you've got the different widths. So like 300 wide, 600 wide, and 900 wide, you can have different images. So we could use those different crop URLs for those different sizes. So as the page is smaller, say if it was on mobile, it would only serve a smaller image on mobile. So we can create different crop sizes. So when we did the image cropper, we could have set it like we've got tiny, that's for it to load in with the first thing you see. But yeah, on mobile, you might want it to be 500 wide or something like that. So you can define those different sizes and uh, put them in here. So uh, that was the lazy loading as well. So I think we've crammed a lot into this episode um, and hopefully you've got a lot out of it. Uh, if you do like the episode, please click on like on the video in YouTube. And um, if you want to see more of my videos, click on subscribe. And I think if you, you can press the bell to get notified when, you go, when there's a new video that I've um, published. Um, also, if you did want to say thanks by buying me a coffee, you can do. If you go to cochair.co.uk slash coffee, um, I'd really appreciate it if you did, but there's no obligation to. And thanks to those that already have. I do appreciate it, and I've enjoyed the coffees from it. Um, I think, I'll, yeah, I'll put all the links to the resources that I've used in, in the show notes at the bottom of the video. Um, yeah, also... This week I released um, my new version of CodeShare, which is in Umbraco V8. So um, it should be a bit easier to navigate now. I've got 
different things on here, make things more discoverable. A lot of people didn't realise that I've got guest authors on CodeShare. So there's been 12 authors, including myself, uh, since it started. And you can find videos. So if you go to here and you want, that will take you to subscribe to my channel. That will take you straight to this series. That will take you to the series I did on Umbraco 7. Maybe you've got to support an Umbraco 7 site. And then I'm going to update all of these to add in all of my videos since I last updated it. But there's a hell of a lot of videos um, on here. But basically, they're all the ones that I've done on YouTube. And then I've just created an article for it. In the blog, there's loads of stuff. If you go to search, you can search by category. And you can find out all sorts of things. So maybe you want to look for Umbraco V8 posts. Click on search. And there's ways to... There's a blog post that I've done about Umbraco V8. Uh, so that's it, I think. And then there's links in there with the Buy Me a Coffee link, etc. So yeah, thanks again for watching. I'll see you on the next video. And take care. Bye-bye.